Hello, I'm Terry Bevel. I am an associate pastor here at First United Methodist Church. I want to greet you and welcome you to our online service. We're glad you could join us today and hope to see you at other of our services. Today we'll have Ann Miller Woodford speaking to us about making the invisible visible. We hope you will profit by this worship service as we continue now in our worship together. Welcome to the video. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace. We finished everybody's trip. Roofing. Roofing? Yeah. But it's not hot in the morning. What about you, Chase? Part of this trip, buddy? When we're not roofing. What? And? At any time. Shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. Hey guys, it's Becky again, and I want to show you this amazing new puzzle that I just got. Look at this box full of a thousand pieces. I love puzzles, and I am going to have so much fun doing this all by myself because it's so much easier to do a puzzle by yourself because then you don't have people standing over your, over your shoulder or telling you what to do, or um, you also don't have people that are um, putting pieces in the wrong places and you have to fix it for them and all these things. So... It'll be so much easier to do this by myself. All right, let's do it. All 
Okay, so this is a whole lot harder to do by myself than I thought. Um, I've been working for a long time on this puzzle and I have made one connection. You know, we just did a puzzle at the beach when we went as a family and my mom and my, my brother and my husband and my children and my brother's partner and I and their kid all worked hard on this thousand piece puzzle together and we finished it in a day and a half. And we did this, we worked on it off and on. We didn't sit down and do it all at one time. You know, what was really nice about doing that puzzle together is that there were sections that we each decided that we would wanna work on. So my brother really liked doing um, this, the orange flowers on this puzzle. And so he would spend time working on that piece. And you know, I didn't even see that as something that was important to me. And so I decided I was gonna do all the purple flowers and I spent a lot of time working on the purple flowers. And you know, some parts of this puzzle, um, I didn't even see how it would fit together, but my mom would pick up a piece and see where it would go. And we needed each other. You know, we all approached the puzzle differently. We all thought that we could do this on our own, but you know what? At the end, it was a big cheer because we all took part together and worked together to make it happen. You know, sometimes we need each other. We need to see each other and we need help seeing things that other people see. So we need to remember that in the church of God, in the family of Christ, we need one another and it's important that we work together. Today's scripture reading comes from Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Oh, I love that greeting. <laughs> My name is Anne. Of course, you know that already. First, I just want to thank God for the awesome gifts that he's given to me. I appreciate Pastor Keith Terman for the invitation, for Dr. Mary Brown for the referral, and Pastor um, Becky Brown, and all of you who've welcomed me here today. Prayer. May the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, who loves me, and all of these who are here to hear and understand what I have to say. Amen. Well, I'm a 75-year-old African-American female community leader, author, artist, and I believe in tearing down walls and those walls that divide us all. And I want to build bridges. And those bridges across the lines of race, religion, national origin, and anything else that separates us in this wonderful country that we have. So, I'm here today to give you some snippets of my life and to give some suggestions. And so I hope that you will uh, accept them and talk to me afterward. If there are questions, I'm really happy to talk with anybody that wants to talk with me about what I have to say or questions that you might have about racial justice and racial anything across the lines of race. I'm a historian. And I want to tell the stories of far western North Carolina African American people. We have a really small population of African Americans. It's 1.5% or less. And when you see so few of us, it makes us almost seem invisible. My responsibility is to make the invisible visible. So today I'm talking about privilege and responsibility, making the invisible visible. For, it took five years for me uh, to get oral histories from my father. I researched and documented the lives of some of these seemingly invisible people in the counties west of Buncombe. It's been said that when any one of our elders dies, a whole library goes with them. To document our lives, I've written a book called When All God's Children Get Together, a celebration of the lives and music of African-American people in far western North Carolina. Well, I grew up in a region surrounded by what they called sundown towns. My grandfather built the first house in the black community in Andrews that um, we called Happy Top. And it used to be the black community, but they have adopted it all the way down to the edge of the town of Andrews. 
everybody loves being from a place called Happy Top. Um, my grandpa and his family were a part of the nightmare of expulsion of all blacks from coming Georgia in Forsyth County in 1912. Everything that they had worked for was taken away from them by the white caps who burned their church, their school, and all the black businesses that were taking place. They chased out 1,100 black people from their homes at gunpoint, and they never gave their property back to them. This followed a lynching of two young black men. By taking our land, the people of Forsyth County became richer. If you want to document this information elsewhere, you can read a book called Blood at the Root by Patrick Phillips. I'm so glad that Grandpa took the chance when he asked a white man about buying property in a time when it was illegal for a white person to sell land to a black person. Where do we turn when the law is against us? I now live where I grew up. I have my art studio in the home that my father built by hand from scratch. My brave late father walked in his father's footsteps as he fearlessly traveled into those regions where African Americans were fully aware of the signs at the entries to towns that said, inward, you better not be caught here after dark. Daddy did his work without regard to those families that had mistreated our people, and today he is still honored for his bravery and fantastic work that he did as a traveling butcher. Um, and he always treated people well, and they loved him for that. Today, there are a few stand-up leaders who will take a chance with their lives to support racial justice. Some of you may have heard of James Reeb, who was a white Unitarian minister he became nationally known as a martyr to the civil rights movement when he died on March the 11th, 1965 in Selma, Alabama, after he was attacked by a group of angry supremacists. I remember my father with love and enduring respect. My one room, Andrew's colored Negro school, where there was no indoor plumbing, was heated by a large coal stove that sat right in the middle of the room. My daddy, Pearl Miller, was hired to build fires for us and make sure that there was always coal for the stove. During some of those years, my dad didn't have a vehicle, so he walked to work, and ba back in those days, there was snow, real snow. We had deep snow. <laughs> Many people will remember that. Um, he would walk to work to the school and then walk on from there to work. Well. When we went to school, we could just step into his footsteps and it wouldn't get snow into our brown high top shoes. So I say, if we follow Christ's steps, we'll be able to build bridges and tear down walls that divide us. I'm glad that daddy left his big footsteps for me and has helped me throughout my life and especially in Andrews where he was highly respected as a deacon in the church and as a man of many talents and skills. Jesus Christ said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. I think I heard that earlier. Daddy loved to work. He was out of the house before sunup and often got back after sundown. He was strict, but he never believed that his daughters should do common labor, just as his father didn't believe that for his daughters. So when Daddy took us to the fields, or I helped him build a barn, or worked on a roof. That was playtime for me. I just loved it. <laughs> That's the way kids are, right? <laughs> I loved his way of telling stories. There's one of his stories that he told about persistence and ability to shake off adversity. Once there was an old mule that couldn't work any longer, the farmer threw him in a well and began to throw dirt on top of him, never paying attention to the aged mule that had worked so hard for him over many years. As the farmer continued to shovel dirt on top of him, the old mule would just shake it off, pack it down, and he kept on until he was able to just walk right out of the well. <laughs> then he walked right past the heartless farmer. Well, I speak a lot about my daddy, but mama was an amazing, forgiving person. 
Um, she instilled in us a hope for the future of our lives. We watched Mama as she made her famous lemon meringue pies, and on Christmas Eve, she made three cakes so that we could have cake breakfast on Christmas morning. When I felt mistreated, Mama would say to me, heap coals of fire on their heads by being as kind as you can and let go and let God. That encouraged me to be more forgiving like she was. One time she broke into song as she explained that there is a paradise waiting for me if I will allow God to handle the situation. She sang, sang there is a land of faithless day, free from all sorrow, pain, pain or care. And they tell me that there's no night over there. Mm -hmm. It's just over the hill. Let all that you do be done in love. Talk is not cheap. We can forgive and be forgiven by talking with each other and explaining the hurts that we feel while doing our best to understand the mistakes and missteps of others. Some people will not accept our words immediately and some will never accept our loving kindness. For those who are insulted, we must move on in life and do the best we can to show them love anyway. Love is all about forgiveness and having a turnaround from suspicion, hatred, and retribution. I've done all I can to walk in my parents' and grandparents' footsteps, realizing that, they, that if they had not been honorable people who believed that we were as good as anybody else, the many doors that have been unlocked for me would never have been opened. I founded a small group of black women who wanted to do all we could back in 1998 to tear down the walls of division and work with all people to help our regional economic, social, and religious life and understanding. Along with our extensive community development work, One Dozen Who Care Incorporated has held a small regional annual multicultural women's development conference in April for 20 years. That, it, that conference pulls together women of diverse backgrounds from as far away as California, Maine, and New York to hold hands in solidarity against the evils of divisiveness in our country. I invite all women to join us at the Hinton Rural Life Center in Hayesville on April the 21st and 22nd of 2023. If you need more information, you can go to onedozenwhocare.org. Our privilege and responsibility. We cannot talk about African American history and our relationship with white people without talking about the race-based bondage of black human beings that began in 1619 when black indentured servants were traded for goods and services in Hampton, Virginia. They and millions of other black humans became as animals or chattel to be bought and sold for profit to create wealth until 1863 when the Emancipation Proclamation declared them free. They must have sung, Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me, my Lord. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Paul wrote in his letter to the Galatians that Christ said, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Serve one another humbly in love. When I was young, our people once visited a, a revival at a community white church. One woman got down to pray in words that stuck with our people for many years after. She said, God bless these good colored people. We know, Lord Jesus, that they have souls just like we have. At that time, we were highly insulted, but I came to understand when I got to know her better that she was courageous. She was courageous to make a statement like that because some of the people 
in the community believed that black people didn't have souls. They believed that we had tails. Some were taught in their homes and even in their churches that African Americans as a race were cursed by Noah. Well, that misunderstanding was a misread of the scriptures. Noah never cursed Ham. His angry prediction had nothing to do with African people. If Noah's son Ham, hear this, if Noah's son Ham, his grandson Canaan, whom he did curse, and their offspring were black, what about Noah and the rest of his family? What color were they? Many white people believe that we're supposed to be slaves because we were animals to be bought and sold. Paul said, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. And then he repeats it in Colossians and he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Jesus said, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. When I was a little kid, we believed that because many black people live with the hope that one day our people would achieve leadership positions, become wealthy and be first. They believed that they were forgiving. If they were forgiving and loving, God would really repay them. Unfortunately, that scripture may fuel the fears of those who study the great replacement theory. It states that non-white individuals are being brought to the United States and other Western countries to replace white voters to achieve a political agenda. It is predicted that white people would become a minority in the early 2040s. I ask you to research that on your own. Isaiah says, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. God is a spirit. We are the hands and feet of God. We need to use our hands and feet to do the right things. When I was a child, we were taught to overachieve. Our people told us you have to be twice as good and work twice as hard to get half as far as a white person. Many of us did that. We did all we could to be the best that we could. But some became alcoholics or just dropped out because they thought that with unequal justice, poor educational systems, and backbreaking work for little pay, they should just give up. I implore my people to use our responsibility, power, and freedom to love and forgive all those around us, even our adversaries. My white brothers and sisters, please use your privilege and responsibility to do as, to do as Jesus commanded. He said, second only to loving God is to love your neighbor as yourself. And it's written, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And his new commandment was love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. God loves us so much that he gave us Jesus. True Christian love is costly. To, be, to really love someone makes you vulnerable. Making the invisible visible? Appalachia has sometimes been viewed as underprivileged, backward, poverty-stricken, ignorant, and white. When most artworks and crafts are produced here, they have been sold at cheap prices or given away to family and friends and always seem to be create, created by white artisans. I'm a fine artist, and I'm here due to the support of my family, especially my baby sister Nina, my favorite teacher, Miss Ida Mae Logan, in that little one room, uh, one teacher school, and a gift of used art supplies from an, an itinerant white nurse who saw my gift and wanted to support it. Appalachia's black people were renamed Afrolachians, so if you hear that word, you'll know where that came from. In the 1990s, early 1990s, the poet educator Frank X. Walker, using the colorful vernacular of African American people, called it that name, Afrolachian. My church is a traditional black church in Andrews. It's Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. 
When I grew up as a member and a part of the Miller family, it was really important for us to live in a way that honored our family name and our church. I'm pleased and grateful that over the years, my church has always welcomed people of diverse races and denominations. It has been very strange to me how some white people invite me to their churches, but they rarely accept an invitation to visit mine. Dr. Mary Brown, which some of you, whom some of you will know, changed that when she reached out to help build bridges across the lines of race and other divisions when she spoke at our Baptist church in Andrews. The Methodist church, your church, has significant meaning in my life. Because of graduating from that little school in Andrews and having no place to go after eighth grade, Allen High School was located in Asheville and that was supported by the group at that time called the Methodist Women's Division of Christian Service. And I received an outstanding education there from 1961 to 1965. I'm so pleased, and if there's anybody who's of the age that they gave support for that, thank you very much, but thank all of you for hanging in there and still being there to be supportive. Your general commission in 1968, your, your general commission on religion and race gathered to hold the newly formed United Methodist Church accountable for its commitment to reject the sin of racism in every aspect of the life of the church. Your church stance regarding dismantling racism has forced United Methodists to confront your own institutionalized racism. It's so, it's so unfortunate that there are people uh, who up don't understand Black Lives Matter and CRT. Please read your own website, General Commission on Religion, and you will find a clear explanation of what CRT is. And know that it's not being taught in your elementary schools. It is taught in colleges where there are mature adults and, and graduate student for, to graduate students. But there are people who want to tear down and cause angry barriers and divisions by giving you misinformation. I hope that you'll make a special effort to discuss that just because no one talks about it doesn't mean that truth is going to disappear. And so just remember that CRT is not just a black and white issue. It includes uh, uh, Native Americans, uh, Asians, Latinx, Muslims, Jews, Arabs, and any other people of color. So it's up to you to choose if you want to find out more about it for yourself. Use your loving kindness in that way. Love thy neighbor easily flows off the tongues of Christians without considering the true meaning of, that, of those words. If we speak of our family, friends, next door neighbors, sincere love and care for those around us will cause us to consider thinking about others, such as the person who walks the streets with backpacks and people of various races and cultures and religions also. Should you be blamed and punished for the sins of others? Ask yourself, what have I done wrong? Or what have I done personally to help or to harm anyone? Ignoring the issue of creating racial justice is just as bad as negatively acting upon it. Remember, you cannot be condemned for what your foreparents, spouse, or children have done and what they do now. You are not guilty of slavery. You did not brutally murder Emmett Till in 1955 when this person was eight years old and realized that she was black for the first time. You didn't drag a man to death in Jasper, Texas, and you didn't hold your knee on a man's neck for nine minutes, 29 seconds in 2020. But I implore you to consider your own actions through your daily prayers. However, all prayers in the world do nothing if you or no one else can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. There's an old African saying, put some feet on those prayers. The Bible says in Matthew, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet and leave, just go. I say move on if they can't accept 
what good you have to offer. Keep on doing your excellent work of tearing down walls and building bridges. Love has the power to restore a broken and wounded relationship because that's what God used to bring humankind back to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Love your enemy, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. For those who fail to hear his words, Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you rebellious ones. If you are white, you may believe that you don't have a racist bone in your body, because you have black friends, but that's a troublesome myth because just knowing that you work with or you live in a community does not take away some of the racial attitudes that are held by people. So please don't use some of my friends are black, a black defense. Please think before using those words. Another stereotypical phrase that I request you think about before you use it is, I don't see color. It's been said by people of color as well. It's historically been repeated to explain good intentions, it tells me and many other African Americans that I'm invisible. So because you don't mean anything negative by it, I say to you as lovingly as I can, if you don't see color, you don't see me. Look at me. Look into the eyes of your black friends and colleagues and see my people through their eyes and view this piece that is down here that I painted in a series I call Black in Black on Black. Please note that just because I'm an outspoken person of color, that doesn't mean that I can speak for a whole group of people. Thank you for understanding that. Get to know people for yourself. We need to think before we speak. I refuse to judge all white people by the actions of some. However, some African Americans have grown tired of begging white people to understand why we see white privilege and unequal justice when we swim in it every day. Some people are disturbed when I say that you have white privilege. We all have privilege. I have privilege too. I have the privilege of being an educated, thanks to the Methodists, well-supported black woman. Am I better than a person called homeless? Jesus Christ said, whoever will, let him come. We can no longer accept the phrase, that's just the way it's always been. We have to learn to truly love one another. Jesus said, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. I heard this scripture earlier, now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of these is love. As I conclude, I implore you with these words from Proverbs. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. I want to thank you for seeing me and hearing my words. I hope I encourage you to know yourself and to take on the responsibility of love through Christ Jesus. Most important to me is, as Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And today you've been very kind to me and you've made me feel good and I'd like to say, I'd like, love for you to sing with me. Will you sing with me? Can I get everybody to stand up? And let, while you're standing, I'm going to tell you that there's a, a song that we, we know Canaan land, the mi land of milk and honey. And we know that African-American slaves, enslaved people, wanted to go north. They call that Canaan land. Um, we today want to build love and harmony. And that's what our Canaan land is going to be when we're all together working together and not even paying any attention to racial barriers. So this song is called Canaan Land and it's called a call and response song. African Americans were not taught to read. So a leader that knew how to, to sing the first words, the people followed. So 
when I say, I'm on my way, you follow up with, I'm on my way to Canaan land. I'm on my way to Canaan land. I'm on my way to Canaan land. Then all together we say, I'm on my way, praise God, I'm on my way. Now we're going to do the next verse, and you all do it as fast as you can behind me. <laughs> if you don't go, I'll journey on. If you don't go, I'll journey on. If you don't go, I'll journey on. I'm on my way, praise God, I'm on my way. If you don't go, don't you hinder me. If you don't go, don't you hinder me. If you don't go, don't you hinder me. I'm on my way, praise God, I'm on my way. All right, you all are great. <laughs> uh, my closing word, my closing prayer is based on words that I heard from many of the older people as they prayed at my church when I was a little girl. When I've sung my last song, can't sing no more. When I prayed my last prayer, can't pray no more. Give me a peaceful and happy hour to die. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry to take so much time. <laughs>
those whose efforts on our behalf we ignore, those whose talents and skills we demean. We have devised so many ways to divide ourselves by race, gender, orientation, economic status, language, creed, how many people we refuse to see, how many people whose presence we refuse to acknowledge, how many people whose God-given dignity we refuse to respect. Forgive us, Lord, of that which we are all guilty, even as we often fail to realize it ourselves. Open our eyes that we may see those who we have ignored, those who we have made invisible. Form us into your kingdom, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, where we are all one in Christ Jesus. This we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Another one here, and the, the, the bridge of this is coming rain down on us, rain down on us, Lord. And uh, we just come here this morning, no matter how we are, uh, the struggle that we've had this week, a separation we have um, with God or one another. We just want to come here today with that. We lay down those things that separate us from God and from one another. And we say, God, we want to be here and worship you. We want to be filled up here this morning. So those things that are that we're holding on to, that luggage that we're holding on to, we can just be here. Lord, I pray that we can just lay that down here for this hour. Let's just continue in worship, singing this song. All my this crowded desert land, I tell myself, keep walking on.
We thank you for coming and joining us for worship today. And so may we all go out in the spirit and love of Jesus Christ, who once loved us for us to love each other and the world. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we bless this service today. Amen.